question I, I picked out for discussion. Again, I'm, I'm like going through this book and, and using it as a foundation. Um, what, what are some specific ways that your spiritual path calls to you to move beyond me and reach out to honor others through love, compassion, and community? Good question. Could you read that over again? Sure. What are some specific ways that your spiritual path calls to you to move beyond me, meaning yourself, and reach out to honor others through love, compassion, and community? Well, I think that's one of the aims of the ministry, right? We acknowledge and honor and uh, ordained and consecrate people, we see their full potential and we honor and respect that. I think that goes a long way to reaching out and helping others uh, move into grace. Well, and, it, and it's interesting, um, Paula, Kevin, Danny and I were having a brief conversation about dementia and how one approaches a person with dementia. Um, and, and then we kind of expanded that up to others as well, because when a person has dementia, um, they, I mean, Paula, do you want to explain what you were saying about them being fully aware? Or no, it was Kevin, you said that. Kevin right? was saying, yeah. Yeah, uh, it was uh, just uh, listening to mediums. A lot of the time they'll bring through family members who died of a dementia. And the family member will always come across with stories where they knew exactly what was going on around, around them. And uh, they were... They just were totally understanding, just not able to communicate back. And so uh, when dealing with them, you should, you know, deal with them uh, on a respectful level and on their level. And it may take a little coaxing and cajoling, but uh, you're guiding them as opposed to telling them what to do. And so then that also, uh, we we should deal with each other in re with respect, you know, the same respect. And like, we should meet them on their level instead of demanding them to meet on their level, on my level sort of thing. So that's just the way... I've always been raised to think that uh, ever since I can remember, I, I thought like that. I was the one sticking up for the kid being bullied in school. I was the one that would befriend them. And I guess that is, uh, I, I guess I think it's your soul reaching out without you even knowing. Uh, and breaking that, you know, and teaching us the benefits of we, you know, and because uh, how we deal with someone, uh, how we deal with the least of these, we deal with ourselves. And uh, I want you to have the same rights I want. And so uh, that's all, you know, and that is, like you said, it, it's part of this ministry is uh, I think everyone reaches out uh, in their own way and no, no one is more right than the others, but we're all, we're kind of all in this together. Yeah, I totally agree. I think it takes a village, right? in all yeah. aspects of life, raising children, caring for elders, etc. Mm -hmm. I have a cousin whose mother went through dementia, my aunt, and uh, she, she comes from a very spiritual family. My uncle was a bishop for the Southwest USA, so he was a big wig. They were very spiritual, very religious, and very kind and respectful, and always, you know, their P's and Q's were always in place. There were no, you know, angry outbursts in public and all that sort of thing. 
But when the mother went through the dementia, she started getting angry and really fighting back and coming up with all these things. And the daughter was shocked. I mean, she was the youngest daughter of all. And she basically said, I don't know how to deal with this. Was she holding that pent up anger all these years? Or is this something totally different because her brain is different? And so she, with the help of the family and the community and everybody that loved the entire family, came together and said, let's just deal with her, you know, with as much love and respect as we can and work her through this. So I would be very curious to see if she came back through a medium and explained what the heck was going on, because I know that happens with a lot. So basically what happens in Alzheimer's is the brain is actually broken and this mm -hmm. frontal lobe um, in many cases um, goes from gray matter to white matter. And that's where your inhibitions are. So when those inhibitions are gone, wow. all the swear words come out of the darndest little old ladies. Wow. Um, and things like, I had a lady from New Jersey who sat on somebody else's husband's lap and said, shall we talk about what comes up? I thought he was going to die <laughs> on the spot. He didn't know what to say. So wow. I just made a joke. You know, but it's because that inhibited inhibition is gone. Yeah. And all the things you were told you couldn't do or couldn't say all your life came out. Um, and it was amazing. Some of the words I learned. <laughs> uh <-huh>. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, you know, and some of the things I saw and, and the horror on the families. Yes. Um, yes. But again, when you've got a broken brain, and you can't control yourself. And then sometimes they would realize what they said and they'd be mortified. Yeah. So my job as a nurse, because that was my specialty, was to teach the families um, how to deal with that. It's like, don't get upset. Don't try to correct her. Yeah. Just sort of, you know, kind of go with the flow, so to speak. And Do you remember uh, the movie that starred Joanne Woodward? And it was about her uh, being a college professor and getting Alzheimer's. My name is and still Alice. What was it? My name is still Alice. Maybe that was it. Um, Remember that one. It, it, was, it was remarkable. She did the most incredible job on that movie because she went through <clears throat> all the stages like that. And, you know, she'd always, as a college professor, she'd always been relatively reserved. And of course, you know, very correct in her behavior. And her husband was just, you know, appalled when one day she started like trying to chase him around the house and, you know, handle his uh, privates and, 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 you know, they were married. So that wasn't like, you know, but it was shocking to him that, you know, that this person that was so reserved, you know, but that, that explains why that happens. And anyway, it was a great movie to, to watch to, um, get an idea of how that happens. Well, and, and so, you know, and so, you know, people with dementia, it's, it's kind of easy to, <laughs> not easy, but I mean, we, we know that, that they have a broken brain, but we have a lot of people around us too, who have like broken, broken emotions or, or, or broken, um, broken spirit. Right. And so from a ministerial perspective, um, how do we, I mean, and, and, and again, it's, I, for me, I think it's, I think it's easier to, um, to deal with a stranger than it is to deal with our family and friends when, when they are taking their brokenness out on us, right? Well, is it, is it brokenness or is it just repressed feelings well, so, that were there? Yeah, you know, so, I, I, during my life, during my life, I've always loved when I get to the real feelings of people and, or the real feelings myself. You know. And that's not the only feelings, that's just some of the real feelings. Right, so, right, so for, um, yeah, and, 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 you know, brokenness is just one word. We can use many different words to describe someone whose emotions are coming out sideways at us, right? So well, I, I mean, I want to, I want to know. Well, well, what's going on with? Uh, do, do you really think I've been an asshole sometimes? And they probably say, yeah, you know. 
uh, and uh, okay, tell me about it to help to help them release because they're saying it because it's something that's there and, and coming up. Whether it's it's not the only thing that's there, but it's something that's there. I, I, I think want to help facilitate it. Yeah, I think your brain is rewired because I know me with since the PML. Uh, there are some aspects of me that are totally different than I was prior to the PML. And it's not, it's not a chemical thing. My brain is just rewired and, and it coincides with parts of the, the parts of the brain that were, uh, more severely damaged. So I, uh, I can understand using the word broken, but maybe we should use the word rewired. And because uh, uh, when something's broken, that's a negative connotation. Uh, you know. Yeah, that's why I was saying it. That's why I was yeah. saying it. Rewired. Rewired is a good way. I think yeah. To say it. Well, I know that's the way I am in my head. I'm rewired. And so I've just had to learn to be rewired kind of thing. And it's still, it's, uh, it, it's still happening. I, you know, I could do today what I couldn't do yesterday. I'm, and I'm seeing the changes still 20 years into it. So, uh you know, when you're dealing with someone with a rewired brain, it's a lifetime commitment, whether you want it or not. The scenario that um, Danny was just talking about with people, you know, I like that saying that what you think of me is none of my business. But when you're dealing with a person who has a need to tell you something about yourself, you know, that annoys them or whatever, that's when we bring into effect uh, Don Miguel Ruiz's book, The Four Agreements, and um, decide that, that we're not gonna take it personally, one way or the other. And um, so that, that's why that book comes in handy a lot, is you know, be impeccable with your own word. If we did that throughout our lives, we wouldn't have that pent up stuff. Um, but a, another point that I'd love to make is the fact that um, <clears throat> someone went on a rant about how horrible political correctness was. And the truth was that I had to disagree with that. I think that political correctness keeps us from labeling something in one camp or another until we can get to a place where we understand it better. So it's, it's politically incorrect to use racial epithets, for example. And I think it should be because that's not a positive thing when we reduce people to a stereotype or a joke or a meme, you know? So, and I don't think that it's being overly sensitive because I think we need every tool that we can find. Our natural default being in this dimension is to label things and to decide that they're either good things or they're bad things. And there's a whole lot of things that run right down the middle of that fence that are gray. And they are neither good nor bad. And if you look at the biggest picture, which is the entire structure of everything, nothing is good or bad, it simply is. And that's the kernel of truth in all Eastern religion, that things are not good, they're not bad. So what we've got are people that are scared by that thought and they run off into these little enclaves of others that will support them in their fear. And I, I think that that is, uh, yeah, political correctness is there for a very good reason. But Francis, could you read the question again? Just so we stay on track with it because I'm, I'm getting lost. What are the specific ways that your spiritual path calls to you to move beyond me and reach out to honor others through love, compassion, and community. So what, so what, what gets you to move beyond the me? Okay, spirit? so I can address that um, in terms of, you know, it, it's been several years since I've gone to church. 
while I was going to church, I had to really think about why I was going to church. And it turns out that I was going to church for the me. I was going there to do things to get accolades for that or to be, um, you know, considered pious in the community or there was a long list of reasons why I went to church. And then when we stopped going to church and not a single person from the church called, I realized that, okay, there's probably several reasons for that. Maybe one, they think of me as a leader and people don't tend to, you know, it's, it's like all the famous people that don't get out and do a show that's like the best one that they've ever done. And they go home by themselves because everyone else assumes that they have this big crowd of people with them, right? So in the making the decision not to, not to really go to church anymore, I thought, what's the real reason for this? And it was to cement the spiritual ideas of how to live my life. And so I thought, well, I can do that without going to church. I can do that by, for example, I don't think Marie would mind me sharing this, but you know, when, and she was not the first, but the, um, when Mike got cancer and they had lost their savings and, you know, that's, that's how we handle health in America is we bankrupt people and force them into taking whatever help they can get. But this was like, you know, I think that you two should come and move in with us. And it's not like I really wanted or needed a roommate, but I did have a need to be helpful. And that was an area where I could be helpful. And I've been doing that for, I don't know, 20 years or more, probably 40 years, because I've always had roommates always kind of live communally. So this is the first for us to be like quarantined just with each other. And um, amazingly, we still like each other and that's a good thing. But that satisfied the idea that, you know, that I was helping, even if it's a one-on-one, -on -one, that's perfect. If we all did that, there would be no one in need because everyone would have someone who was you know, a little bit better off, at least for that moment, because it's cyclic. When I give advice to people, I always end that advice by telling them, please remember what I'm telling you so that you can repeat it back to me when it's my turn. You know, because they want to say, oh, you're so wise. Let, yeah, right. So I forget this stuff just like you do. So, you know, just remember it so that you can tell it to me, you know, when I need that. <laughs> So that was it. Just um, I decided to do the kinds of things that um, the church claimed that they were doing on my behalf. And I thought, eh, cut out the middleman. I'm just going to go right one on one and and do as much as I can for as many people as I can. And that's been very satisfying and fulfilling. Uh, that's that's very sweet. I, I don't try and and move beyond the me anymore, at least in this phase of my development. Um, I, I like including the me because I want to be present. I, I want to be present there. It's not like I'm ministering to this person from a higher place. You know, I'm just being a live human being with another live human being or another group. Because uh, you know, I studied yoga for a long time, and 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 part of yoga can be self abnegation. You know, if you if you negate yourself, you can become God. Well, well, God is includes me, and it includes all of us. So I like I like I I enjoy life most when when I'm being real and somebody else is being real, and we connect. And and, and in order for us to be I have to be there just as much as I have to honor the other person being there. So it sounds like, Danny, you become a we. Yeah. We, 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 we. <laughs> All the way home. <laughs> All the way home. <laughs> Don't forget the roast beef. My spiritual path led me to do the hospice work. Um, to take myself out of me and and to be there for others, especially at their time of need. And that's been very fulfilling for me. 
even during the pandemic, because um, I still was able to visit the ones that were in their homes, not in the nursing homes or, or hospitals, but I could still visit the ones that were in their homes. And, and I mean, talk about being isolated and when you're in hospice and pandemic. Um, so I, I found that very rewarding. And um, I, it, it's been kind of hard um, lately because I, I'm a people person and I, I like to be around people. I mean, I've been a, a leader most of my life. I've a supervisor and a, um, an exercise instructor and a meditation instructor and a dance instructor. And I'm used to being in front of the crowd and I'm used to being with a lot of people and a lot of people enjoying what, what I'm giving them and what, what we're doing. And I, I'm not able to do that anymore. So the hospice program really gives me some light at the end of the tunnel, so to speak. Yeah, I think different stages of our life create different opportunities for us to, you know, be on a spiritual path. I know early on, I went, I was in the experiment of living in communal ways, you know, the Sedona experiment, the Hawaii experiment, it was all about how many people can we bring in to do these transformational works, because transformation is the breaking through of what we were talking about earlier, and that is the rewired of whatever we're into that's holding us back. And so we would sort of, you know, do the brain blow, you know, it's like, wake up and see how people take that. And then with, with the community being in place, you got to nurture the aftermath. And in some cases it was brilliance that extended beyond. And in other cases, they just continued to come back to workshops. It's like, I still got to work on that, still got to work on that. So in my mind, I feel at this stage in my life, that the best way that I can serve is to think about people's futures in humanity. You know, it's kind of a big plan, but I've, I've found a group of people who are literally taking action to make the future brighter. And we've got a, a billion people who are now gonna be considered boomers. And so what do we do with these people when technology is moving so fast that we can't keep up? And I'm the perfect example of it. It's like, look, I have a, an inkling of how and why, but I need help, you know? So my, one of my missions is to help boomers stay relevant because we're gonna be living longer and we're gonna be doing so many different disrupted things that it's gonna be, you know, mind blowing. And so I'm here to be the grounding cord, if you would, to help people find their way through all that. Kind of like hospice, find your way on that path. And it, uh, it serves my being. Nikki, did uh, you hear about the woman that won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry today? I didn't hear it today. Women are winning that more and more now. Thank well, you. Well, she <laughs> developed a way to splice genes just like the ETs did to create us, I guess. But you know, yeah, it okay. was uh, she can eliminate sickle cell and yeah. MS and uh, or maybe it's MD muscular dystrophy. Anyway, yeah. there's like a list: Huntington's disease, long list of those things. But it's actually that she grows um, the right gene sequence in one test tube, and then they figured out how to cut that and paste in the new sequence that doesn't have that disease. Yeah, that's it's pretty CRISPR. remarkable. Yeah. You know, and of course people are like freaking out about, oh, now they're going to do test, you know, designer babies. Oh, I want a blonde haired, blue eyed baby, blah, blah, blah. So, you know, but uh, the community will speak out against that. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. And they already have. But yeah, she actually won. She won uh, she a did. fight yeah. between who, not just the Nobel Prize, but she won the fight between who discovered this. So there was another guy who was in the, in the mix saying, it, no, it was my idea, my idea first. And I started publishing early. And so that fight went on and she's the one that came out on top. So it's like- Any of us that ever watch Big Bang Theory know about how that works, you know, because yes. um, they had that exact scenario in there where another couple of guys came in and tried to take Sheldon and Amy's work yeah. and make it theirs, but- Anyway, that was um, yeah. that was pretty remarkable 
and I'm having to look at things from a different perspective too. Like uh, if you've ever been into conspiracy theory, you know that um, there's a whole bunch of stuff about the way that Washington DC was designed and mm -hmm. oh, it was this and that and you know, it, and it was created for nefarious reasons. And then I just simply heard a woman on Facebook say, yeah, DC is one of the most magical places in the world. And I thought, well, now that's a really unique way to look at it. So I started saying, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna start flipping that switch and thinking of things as, yep. you know, uh, uh, from a different perspective. So like GMOs have been, they've really gotten a bad rap. And I thought, well, it's not all bad. And that's what, you know, so anytime anyone wants to force you into a cube of this is good and this is bad, or any cube at all, that's when you need to take a couple of steps back and say, yeah. maybe I can look at this from a different perspective. So anyway. Well, and, that, and that's a perfect example of, you know, how we can approach people in our spiritual path, you know, that we, we step out of ourselves and, um, and try to see the world through others' eyes, right? Yeah. There's, um, I think I mentioned last week, there's a, there's a friend of mine whose fiance committed suicide a couple of weeks ago and she gets so caught up in the story and trying to, trying to like recreate the what ifs and all of that sort of thing. And I, you know, last night I finally had to stop her. I'm like, I'm like, you know, how does this help you to rehash what's already been in the past? you know, and, and why are you telling me this? I often say to her, why are you telling me this? Cause she's, she's telling the story and telling the stories. And, and I'm like, why are you telling me this? And then she can drop down out of her head and explain, you know, and, and like finally get to, to, to her own emotions around it and the lessons she's learning. See, that's the big me talking right there. You know, when someone wants to rehash something thinking that, gee, if, you know, if only I had done or said something differently, then I could have been in control of this situation and not, you know, let this bad thing happen. So there's a couple of things going on there. First of all, you don't have that kind of power. That person made their decision. You, you don't have power over another person's decision. You can try and that's where you will experience pain because it's the pain of the resistance because you're not doing the thing that's for your own highest good if you try to insert yourself into that situation and you know make it your fault or take credit for you know either way it, it's like that's not going to be the best you know the best is to observe and realize that that person has made their choices and while you can still grieve and miss them, it, it does, you're right. You're absolutely right about that. It does not help her to uh, come to grips or terms with that, if that's the case. So. So how about, how about you, Paula? How do you um, come out of the me? Well, I think my career has always done that for me because my patients always came first. But since I don't do that anymore, um, it's been a little difficult. So I've decided to adopt other women because I've always adopted. I have so many adopted daughters and sons. It's ridiculous. Um, and so I, somebody called me that I hadn't talked to in five years and we've been getting together and I've shared with her the book, Women Who Run With the Wolves. And we're discussing it and we're discussing it on many, many levels. Um, so that's my way of getting me out of me because I wanna hear her story. She came to me to tell me her story actually. Um, and my, I see my position in this relationship as helping her deal with her story. Yeah, I do share my story with her too, which is similar to hers. Um, but my job is not to dwell on my story. It's to help her understand that if she doesn't let go of her story, she'll be stuck in that barrel of dust for the rest of her life. 
Um, and the only reason I share my story is to share with her how I stepped out of that story because it does not serve. Um, and so that's what I found is working. Um, it doesn't take much effort, but I don't have a lot of energy since my surgery. So it's, it's like the universe sent her to me for a reason um, because I don't have all my clients to take care of anymore. I don't have any other reason to step out of myself. Um, I do talk to the people at cardiac rehab and we do discuss issues. Um, but this, this young woman um, was definitely sent to me by the creator um, to give me a new path. And I think, you know, that's always, when I had my shop, I had more women coming in for a cup of tea and advice than I ever did customers to buy stuff, <laughs> which didn't, you know, it really wasn't, it wasn't a bad thing for me. It was wonderful. It was company and, um, and one of those ladies just recontacted me after two years of not talking to me too. And she's going through cancer. So again, there's another opportunity for me to step out of me. Uh, and I'm grateful for that because <laughs> I just said to the universe, okay, what do I do now? Um, you know, especially after my surgery, I didn't want to do anything now, but it's been four months and it's time. So that's how I get out of me. Congratulations on being healthy. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. There's a great book that um, you might want to check out. It's called mm -hmm. the Grief Recovery Handbook. Ah. And it has to, it's a process. It lasts about six weeks. You do a chapter at a time and you have to do it with um, one other person at least. And I did this with a friend of mine who also has a special needs daughter, um, a special needs child. And um, what we were grieving was you know, there was no, oh, now it's time for prom. Now it's time for a driver's license. Now is it, we didn't, you know, with special needs kids, you don't get that. You get other monumental things that are great, but you don't get the norm. And so there's a part of you that is grieving that. It can be any kind of loss and probably two weeks is too soon for your friend to get into it. But when she's ready, you could suggest that to her. And it really, it helps you tremendously because there's timelines that you write out. You, you basically have homework and then you get together with your partner the next week and you go over you know, your homework. And um, by the end of it, it does feel an awful lot better, so. What was, what was the name of that again, Jenny? The Grief Recovery Handbook. <clears throat> I'll look and see if I can find it so I can get you the author, but you should be able to find it by the title. Yeah. Sometimes a demarcation between we, me and we. <laughs> I, for me, humor does a great job. Um, you know, there's, uh, if you ever read the book on metapsychiatry, uh, I thought it was brilliant. And he, he talks about, Dr. Thomas Horace, psychiatrist, talks about the three modes of being in the world. And the first mode of being is for oneself. And the next mode of being in the world is for others. And that's what we're talking about we. And the third mode of being in the world is for God. And the, each mode of being, uh, the individual, when you're for yourself, your, your, your freedom is restricted. And as you move out and help others, your freedom is enlarged. But it isn't until your mode of being is through enlightenment, you now, uh, you, you're the freest. So that is often the challenge. Um, and when you were talking about the woman scientist and we're applauding her progress, she, was she in the me or in the we? When you're fighting, you're fighting, you're right. You're fighting for what you think is good for humanity. So in that sense, you're in the me stage. But at some point, if she's compassionate about her fight, then she's, she's probably in the more freedom stage to express her full potential. It's, it, and the lines of demarcation are crazy. My, 
I have an English friend. I, his great sense of humor. It's very dry. He lives in a retirement community. And he was saying that, you know, <laughs> a person living in a retirement community was a flasher. Everybody knows what a flasher is, right? Well, the flasher is getting ready to retire, they thought, but they talked to him and he said, no, I think I'll stick it out for another two years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And the same flasher then moved to Minneapolis in the winter time. And so during the winter, he decided to give people pictures. <laughs> So, you know, the humor uh, that can transcend the pair of opposites. And, um, and I, once in a while, I can find that when I'm helping uh, my wife. Maybe we'll be able to laugh at something together or, or we'll get into singing some old songs and we, we're in harmony kind of speak. Um, but, you know, so much of the time I'm... You, you can't divorce the me, the we, and the, the compassion. It's all part of the process of life. And uh, I think we learn to celebrate it all. What yeah, I think hu humor is good medicine and it can also be coming from a sarcastic household. It's a way of communicating things without um, the confrontation. And so it's good it can move you beyond you into another conversation and it also can be this barrier of really saying what you feel and getting through that barrier that breakthrough that danny was talking about yeah i really want to know what's under that right yeah good point and with the scientists i i agree i say you know the fight definitely fight for my right because I was first. But at the same time, I think what made her win was the community standing up and elevating the fact that it is the right thing for the community to vote this person through. You know, maybe there was an ego thing, an imbalance, or maybe it was gender, I don't know. But uh, she won because the community stood behind her. I think there's been a lot of times when it's like, if you're a woman, you have to fight for the recognition because our society is skewed in a different direction. So, you know, it's, um, and I think you're right. I, after seeing her, she's, she's really um, very even tempered. Her energy is very centered. She knows exactly who she is and she doesn't need to defend herself, but right. her partner, um, her, her work partner w was another woman. And so they both received the prize for, for the work that they did with genetics. And so I thought that was pretty wonderful. But, you know, all kinds of things are coming out with history these days that it that should be um, more herstory because it's like, I never knew until Hollywood made a movie about black women working at NASA that anybody had anything to do with that. And not only were they women, they were black women. And wow, you know, that still blows me away. And, you know, they could have gotten recognition and financial remuneration and all kinds of things. But even in school, I never heard about women doing anything of any import. I mean, Dolly Madison was not really the person that made the flag, you know? And yet, you know, she's like our crumb. <laughs> that gets thrown out there. Oh, look, here, Dolly Madison made a flag. Woohoo! Wasn't that Betsy Ross? Betsy so, Ross. Yeah, okay. Dolly Madison made cookies. I don't yeah, know. she made cakes. Or <laughs> <laughs> the true baker comes out. Yeah. How about Dolly Parton? She was on the news this morning. Did you see that? Yeah, she's awesome. Yeah. I mean, yeah. She, don she donated a million dollars to the to a a school that helped develop the virus program. And then she went there and used herself as a model to take the shot. And she says, I'm taking my own medicine. <laughs> I love yeah. it. <laughs> and she wrote and sang a song about it to the tune of Jolene, which was really great. Yeah, yeah. I love creative people. I know. <laughs> So what about I, 
Go ahead. Sally or Adriana, do you have any any anything to add? For um, I guess I have to say that that my way of uh, of getting out of me and promoting the welfare of the we um, was all the years I spent at the University of Rhode Island running the costume shop and teaching costume technology. Now that's what I did, but that isn't really what I did. What I did was I instilled in a number of young people from a lot of different walks of life, self-respect, self-confidence, um, a sense of a safe space where they could air their feelings and discuss their differences. And a number, a great number of those students that I helped all, all those years have gone on to help others. Some of them working in theater, some of them in corporate. They're, they do all sorts of things. But the thing is that they're, they took what took what they learned in the environment that I created and they <clears throat> are spreading it around. It's like the ripples in a pond when you throw a stone in. And that I think was my contribution to the we, to the health of the planet, to the health of, of humanity. Um, and when I, when I retired from that, it takes a lot of work. 35 years is a long time. When I retired, it took me a while to figure out, all right, where do I go from here? You know, and what can I do now? So I was doing face painting. I've been doing that for, you know, since for the last 12, 15 years. I've been doing the henna on people. And I finally combined my, um, <clears throat> my knowledge of Reiki with the henna. And I was doing healing that way. And then COVID hit. And I thought, oh, now what am I going to do? You know, so <laughs> I'm sort of looking around for for my next uh, my next way that I can help. But at Christmas time, my husband and I played the icons of the season, and we were able to share that joy of much, much more than Christmas. We were able to to spread the joy of family and of communion although it was via virtual visits, we did that to over a hundred families all over the world. And we helped reconnect people that were like in Afghanistan or in uh, Australia or Brazil or wherever. We, we dealt with people from all over the world and um, were able to bring joy to them. And that in turn, I'm sure, spread to their families and their friends and so forth. So. If we really look, we can find ways to take our ministry. And our ministry is spreading love and life, right? I mean, that's what it's all about. So, you know, I, I keep looking for different ways to spread the love and the light through the talents that I've been given and um, through the opportunities that come my way. So keep your eyes and ears open. That's the best way to do it. You're a wonderful role model in every aspect. So maybe you all have a suggestion. I've got a, a granddaughter who, I, who the family's worried about. And uh, she's, uh, she doesn't follow through on anything. She's uh, almost been disowned by her parents. Uh, uh, we've done a lot of, uh, my wife's done a lot of uh, negotiations and try to bring forth reconciliation. And she's a very, you know, she's the 25 or 24 or something like that. And she's got about one more semester, one more year to finish college. And she's not following through on that. And presently she's traveling. Um, she was traveling with a couple of her cousins and visited my son and his family and met two more cousins up north. And uh, th there's a lot of family activity. There's sitting around bonfires, sharing stories, and all that. And she doesn't seem to, everybody's pitching in and helping. And she takes naps. She doesn't lift a finger. 
maybe takes a couple of showers a day. And, and eventually she's probably going to end up um, living here with Bobby and I for a while till she finds herself. But I'll have very stringent rules when she's living here. It's just not a matter of freeloading, but we're concerned about her. And we don't, uh, I th my wife thinks some of the problem is she smokes pot and pot kills your initiative and uh, where you don't want to do anything. And so we're kind of uh, stymied as to how to reach out and help her get beyond where she is, refine herself. Any suggestions? Well, here's here's my suggestion and and that is you know maybe let her fail you you can't help someone who won't help themselves i understand that one francis real well because i tried to rescue my mother for years from alcoholism and finally i had to release and let go well charlie i think you're an admitted uh codependent a self-admitted codependent. I'm not sure that it's the best idea, but it's your choice, of course, to have her move in with you. But I tend to agree with Frances. She's not going to follow your rules. Um, and the reason is because you're making them. And she's not in that space of following the rules because she has she given anyone any indication that she is ever going to follow a rule? I or, don't know. Yeah. So, you know, the thing, the thing to do, and it doesn't sound like um, it's not what we're used to, because we're used to, as human beings, jumping, especially as a male, you think that it's up to you to fix everything that's broken. It is not. That is not your job. Your job as not only a male, a human being, and a spiritual being having a human experience is to love her unconditionally. You can do that whether she's under your roof or she's not. It might be in your best interest not to have her under your roof. That's gonna be someone else that you wind up taking care of because it's really hard to break that urge to do something. And you know, Michael Beckwith, he's got a whole sermon that he does, the title of which is, don't just do something, sit there. <laughs> <laughs> so there may be absolutely nothing that can be done this is an inside job she's got to figure it out on her on her own and like Francis said that might be a situation where if she, if there's no one there to offer her a shower that she can take twice a day or you know free pot or whatever it is that she's doing you know if that's not being offered she can't take advantage of it and she will have to figure out a different way of being or not, but it's her choice. It isn't anyone else's. It's her choice. Yeah, thank you. Something coming up to my mind is you can you can ask a person sometimes, are you enjoying your life? And if they say yes, you say, well, tell me about the part that you enjoy. I'm just curious. And, and let them express the parts that they, and if they say no, then say, well, well, tell me about the parts you're not enjoying, because I'm curious. Let them express themselves or understand that they're not willing to express them. And say, I, I ain't going to tell you. You say, okay, well, if a year from now or a hundred years from now, you feel like it, I'm here. And uh, we, we, uh, we celebrate you and good luck. Now, I don't have a lot of a lot of truck with Dr. Phil, but he has that one expression that I think is really brilliant, and that's "How's that working for you?" Yeah. You know, so uh, <laughs> that's I, I use that a lot. And then when my daughter calls me and she's in crisis, my old behavior around that was to immediately jump right and smack in the middle of her crisis, and and I'd get all discombobulated, and you know. So these days, I just listen when she calls. And then when she's finished emoting, I say, how can I help you with that? You know, but she has to present me with a problem and then she has to tell me, how can I help her with that? Because if left to my own devices, I'd, I'd be creating universes just to try to help her solve her problem. And it's not my problem. And I don't, 
you know, it, it won't work if it's not my problem that I'm trying to solve. All right. Thank you. Yeah, I had a, an issue with a very close family member where he was the one that always pushed the limit. If you drew a line, he always stuck his toe over just to see what would happen. And so he went through many iterations of single parent, went to live with his, well, lived with, was raised with his mother, went to live with his father, ended up leaving because he couldn't handle that either and lived on a park bench in New York City for a while. And then he got sent to boarding school and quit a semester before he was to graduate with his GED. And then he went out into the world and ended up back on another coast with his mother and basically said, look, I, you know, I don't know what I'm doing. He eventually got put into jail a couple times for selling pot. And then when he came out, he kind of just got corrected and he went to work for his father and said, look, I need to change my life. I just know that this isn't working for me anymore. A couple of years there, couldn't tolerate his father anymore. So he left ended up meeting a wonderful woman who helped carry him through and now he's a productive member of society. And so it's like, oh, there is a way, the cycles do come round. Sometimes they take a little longer, but uh, you know, maybe she does need to just find her path because nothing's good enough at this point. Thank you. I was still didn't hear from Mariana. Or my internet keeps going in and out, so I'm trying to <laughs> keep up with everything. But actually, yesterday too, I watched a lot of TV yesterday. I watched this movie, this movie called Soul. I don't know if it's like a new one that just came out, and it's basically about finding your purpose in life. And they go into the universe, um, like where your souls are are created, and just finding a purpose and. Um, I highly suggest watching it, but it's just, I keep going back into it and thinking about what is your purpose in life? Like when you're born and how, and they program these little souls to be like, I'm going to be an anxious one. I'm going to be this. And that's programmed in you before you come down, but then you find your purpose in life. Um, and going back to, to the actual question that we were talking about, um, for me, I've always, I had a store in, in New York for many years and I had a, a similar with Paula, like people would just come in and sit and tell me their life stories and tell me how they were in a fire and they were burned or myth or that, or just random people would always come in and I made some beautiful friendships and I've helped some beautiful souls. But I remember just being like, do you want to buy a shirt or something? <laughs> You're sitting here <laughs> giving you advice. You come in like every week. It's kind of like a therapy session. Um, so I feel like for me, and I have always have friends that come to me and I'm, I'm always listen, I, I listen and, and try to give advice. They ask for it. And I've learned to sit and listen and, and be supportive when they just need the support and, and finding that balance in it. For me right now, I'm going through a huge, uh, transition in life and I hope to, heal myself so I can help others heal. And right now I'm really focusing on healing within and doing a lot of work right now within so I can help others. Like I definitely feel the calling to help new moms um, with the rebirth of their life as a mother, because that's something I've been struggling with and partnership and, and rebuilding the strength and power within. Um, and I hope to share my story and my knowledge with others as I heal. So that's kind of where, where I am on my path right now of, of helping the, the other people around the community around me. Um, and hopefully that's I pretty can... important work. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> definitely needed in Absolutely. this day and age. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, definitely. No instructions. So on if nobody else has said it, thank you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Those new mommies need to find themselves again. You know, you've been living with a parasite, so you know. <laughs> it's a it's a long process. It really is. It's a lot, and people forget. And um, I think it's important to to learn and, and praise the woman you become, and say goodbye to the woman who led you to this place. Mm -hmm. And there are um, there are some. Uh, already in place things to do that in the pagan community they have a 
maiden ceremony, a mother yeah. ceremony or a queen ceremony, and then mm -hmm. um, the crone ceremony. So, you know, there's there's some support out there uh, for the, those kinds of things too. If you need to know more about that, just give me a call or something. I can yeah. turn Definitely. you on to some info. Definitely. I'm a sponge right now, learning all about that for sure. Cool. Could you repeat those four those four worlds? Oh, the one that I just said. Yeah, the pagan world. The, oh, the, the maiden. There's a maiden ceremony. That's the young girl before her menses. The mother. And then in between the mother and the crone is the queen. And that's like still a mother, but with grown children, but not quite a crone yet. So that would apply to the, you know a certain age group. And then you're a, a crone that that's not an age thing. That's a, a year after you've had your last moon cycle, you can uh, go through a croning ceremony and become a crone. And there's one more after that too, with the hag. Oh, okay, yeah. And, and that's over 80. Yeah, the stone and then, there, and then there's one more after that. And, and that's back to the unlimited. Oh, the one after that, you're called an old crony. That's what that one after that. <laughs> I have well, you're, you're in that one, Charlie, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, have a number of, I have a number of croning ceremonies if you want some. Just yeah, kidding. those were fun. We should do those again. I like I ran across that. those the other day when I was cleaning out my office. I thought, oh, you know, we should we should rev those up again. You know, We should. Yeah. That would be a good topic for next week, maybe. Uh, I, yeah, crone ceremonies. Well, crone. Or, or are you talking about the triple goddess? Well, See, that's what that is. That's the the white, red, and black. And that represent the white is the maiden without menses. The red is the mother with menses. And the black is the crone without menses again. So is that what you're talking about? You, you want to know about that whole thing? Well, all of it. All of it. <laughs> including that. And the it, it's levels. Yeah. Just, just an idea. It, it, it's interesting to me. Yeah, maybe we can do more of that as a community. You know, we have the empowerment ceremony and we call it different names. We call it ordination or consecration. But we can have other ceremonies where we're honoring different stages of life. Yeah. Yeah. Is there a sequel to that for men? Does anybody know? Yeah, men could use a lot of help. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know if there is. is Not there? aware of it. Well, there's the boy. There's the boy and the, and the becoming a man. You know. Yeah, that's the confirmation ceremony when he goes in to become his manhood. Right. That's about it. Well, then there's the ceremonies that they used to do for uh, when a young man would become a warrior. Right. Uh, and um, I don't know. Uh, so, so maybe the gentleman research and see what I can find out. Yeah, or or like the or or like the the, the three guys on the call can maybe do a little bit of um, creative creation of of your own ceremonies, like if you had. Um, if you had rites of passage um, in a non-traditional sense, um, what would you like those to look like? Mm -hmm. Think okay. about it and get back to us. <laughs> well, you know what I was working <laughs> no, I mean, really Think about it and, and uh, yeah. go in and, and see what, what would really work for you, what you'd really like. Because just something off the top of your head is going to be a deeply thought out process right okay when i was working with the youth at unity church we did a um segment called um uh, rites of passage and also one called house of god so when we were doing house of god we took all the kids to different you know we took them to a mosque um a buddhist temple a hindu temple you know we took them everywhere so that they could see uh, what the kernels of truth were in all the different religions and then you know why their parents may have chosen 
uh, you know, the religion that they were currently practicing. But one of the things that we took them to, the only, you know, we used to lament the fact that there's not a lot for men. And that's why our men are kind of polarized, you know, into good, bad, uh, you know, they're, they're polarized. So in this case, we took them to a bar mitzvah and I had asked all of our kids to write a mission statement for their lives. And it could, it could be like two lines. That's all it had to be. And they complained about it. And then when I took them to a bar mitzvah and they saw that this young man had had to attend Hebrew school forever and read from the Torah and do all of these things and then stand up at the age of 13 and say, today I'm a man, my father is no longer responsible for my actions. That's a rite of passage that um, white Americans or most Americans do not have. They don't get that. And so we expect people to go into limbo while they're teens because they're, they're not children and they're not grownups. So as far as they're concerned, they're kind of in limbo. They're not allowed to act like children and we certainly don't treat them like adults. So, you know, we, we actually need to have something. Wouldn't that be kind of cool if we put something in place that everybody in the country could use? I, I think in the Jewish faith, the department is that you, you, you're becoming a man. Yes. And you study for it. So, but there's actually, you know, there could be more levels than just go from a child to a man. So, so actually the question I had picked out for next week may actually lead in, into these kinds of, uh, these kinds of thoughts and, and uh, about what it is you would like it to look like. But uh, the question is, take some time and make a graphic representation of your own spiritual journey from your earliest memory to your present. What surprises you? What had you forgotten or misplaced? And that, that's kind of a, a good foundational question for, it's like, okay, if you look back on your own life, where are the places that you feel like, like a recognition, a, a ceremonial recognition might have, have been helpful? And Francis, would you email that question to us so that we can be thinking about that? Sure. And also, um, is next week the time change? Yeah. I, I, probably. I think that's it, it is. It is. Take a walk. It's Arizona. Two minutes. Well, you know, we go, we don't do anything, but we're on Pacific time at once the time changes, which means it's an hour earlier for me. So, yeah. So, uh, right. So, Arizona is the only time, only people it affects really. Oh, really? Yeah. Because everybody else changes their clocks. We don't. So, we have to adjust ourselves. I see. Okay. <laughs> So well, it's about time. It's, it's about time. <laughs> so, um, so one of the things, in, in addition to the to the as we as we do our prayer for closing and and healing, um, let let's also think about or put energy out there, put our energy out there to attract others of a like mind. Or not of a like mind necessarily, but to attract others to the ministry, you know, um, younger, younger blood, not that being elder is, is a problem. I mean, I, I think that the wisdom that we have on this screen is awesome. No, we need more balance. That's okay. We don't have to right. qualify that. It's like, yeah, we need some younger people. <laughs> yeah. So, so I think <laughs> my, my reaction to that immediately is that's a great topic. But I think that's a whole separate topic that that could be a, an, another week like, no, of, of how, how we attract people. No, so, okay, so we have had that discussion multiple times. And so at yeah. this point, you know, what, what I'd like us to do is to create an energy that others are attracted to. That's all I'm asking. Awesome. Well, that's on, that's ongoing, but I mean, it, that's kind of a whole topic. You know, what we were talking about about men and and, and the, the rite of passages and and stages for both men and women is is a is a pretty vast topic. And the the topic of attracting new people is is really a whole separate ongoing topic, but it's a whole separate topic. 
is what I would say. Well, I, I appreciate your, your demarcation, as Charlie would put it. However, I mean, I, I think that a lot of us would like to attract new members. And, and there are different ways we can do that through social media, through keeping people captive on an airplane and things like that. But what I'm asking Danny is that during our prayer, that we put the energy out to attract people to our ministry. It's She's not oh, okay. suggesting it as, as a topic for a Sunday discussion. She's suggesting it as, as something to include in the everydayness of, uh, as we progress. Yeah, oh, so. okay. okay, okay, good. Um, so I want to I want to close with a prayer for peace, and then we'll ask for for healing and attraction. May peace find a welcoming home in my heart. May peace envelop me and flow through me in all that I embrace and all that I do. May I be a beacon of peace, and may I always remember that only a diversity of beacons can bring sufficient light to our paths to show us the way. And so it is. And so it is. So it is. So it is. And thank, thank you, everybody, for being you. So, Francis, you're going to send out the topic to us all to remind us, right? Yeah, I'll send an, I'll send an email, and then Nikki will also include it in, the, uh, in next week's invitation. Right. So, okay, cool. um, and at this moment, um, since we've raised the vibration, if we can just um, now speak the names of people who need healing in whatever way that serves their highest good. All right. Jade. Jade. Ernie. And Victor. Jerry. Charlie. Dale. Hello. Lori. Celia, Hillary, Chris, Jean, Dale, Bobby, Mercy, Charlie, my husband John. So all the names that have been spoken and unspoken, we hold them in our hearts and in our minds and ask for healing in their highest good. Be it. Amen. So it is. Thank you. So it is. Have a good week, everybody. Okay. We'll see you later. Bye bye, everyone. Bye bye. I did not get the invitation this week. No. So just yep. I noticed that. I was going to ask Nikki if that was an experiment. <laughs> okay. I'll, I'll I'll like I, always a Are you couple sure? of I got it. I didn't get it. I didn't get it. Oh. Okay. I just went to the website and got on that way. Huh. Yeah, oh. I'll remind Nikki to put it out there. Hi. 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 Francis, Hi. are we any closer to hiring uh, a person for taking care of the books? Yep. Uh, I, I know Nikki had a few more resumes that she was going through and that she was um, going to make a plan to make some phone calls. Um, she's, she's so extremely busy. Uh, but I also, you know, I mean, she's also the best person to do it, I think. Right. So, yeah. Okay. Thank you. And Charlie, I wanted to say to you that, you know, my heart goes out to you. I mean, I know it's a hard, hard situation, um, especially when it's, it's an offspring, you know? Yeah. Uh, and I, I, I feel for you deeply and, um, and, you know, failing young is the best time to fail. Failing what? Young. Yeah. Being young. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, we want the best for everyone. Right. And yeah. you reach a point where uh, they're not reachable, then you certainly have to let go. Yeah. And I, and I know you want to give it the old college try. Yeah. You're in my prayers. All right. Thank you, Francis. Have a good week. You too.